we all know what a church is. From weddings to funerals and every Sunday in between, you can be sure you'll find one in every city in the United States. It's where the Bible is preached. It's where you go to find encouragement, acceptance, support, sometimes even food. This is what we know the church to be, most of which are registered 501c3 nonprofit corporations, and for good reason. Week in and week out, millions of people, some believers, some not, attend a place like this. Though the size and scope vary, the proceedings are basically the same. The laity sit in the pew, or chair, or audience if you like, while the clergy either sit up front or on the stage. There may be some introductions, maybe even a brief prayer, and usually some sort of music commences. In most modern evangelical megachurches, this is in the form of a rock band. And if you're lucky, a laser light show and a smoke machine. After the music, there may be another announcement, usually followed by an introduction of the head pastor, or senior pastor, or teaching pastor. These terms are typically synonymous, though there are exceptions. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. The reason we've all come. The thing which without, there is no church service. The sermon. For approximately the next hour to hour and a half, the audience quietly and attentively sits, at least they better, or they could be asked to leave. Upon completion of the sermon, there is usually another brief prayer, perhaps an altar call or invitation to receive Christ if you have not. After the people are dismissed, there's likely coffee and refreshments available to enjoy. For the overwhelmingly vast majority of people, I just described a typical Sunday morning church service. Even if you're part of a church that does not gather in this fashion, you're obviously familiar with what I just described as you probably began in this system yourself. The term system is intentional and at least begins to highlight the problem that I wish to address. Let me begin by asking a question. Do you know what this is? Or this? How about this? Well, if you've ever been to a play before, you do. These are obviously theaters, where performances are offered to paying theater goers. The audience remains silent and seated so as not to disrupt the show. The actors take the stage and perform what they have rehearsed. This is the relational dynamic of the audience and performer. One passively listens while the other performs. The express purpose of a stage is to elevate a person or a group of people so that a large audience can see and hear them. Stages of all sorts are intended to elevate, highlight, focus upon a person, a band, a group of actors, ballerinas, or any other performer. Do you notice any striking similarities between every concert or play you've ever been to and nearly any church service you've ever heard of? For starters, the people on stage are paid to be there. They are the professionals. Now, let me take a moment to clarify. I am not addressing the theological soundness of the doctrines being taught, but rather addressing a platform that is common to the heretical Roman Catholic Church and every denomination of Protestantism that I'm aware of, from Lakewood to Grace Community Church, from the Ecumenical Saddleback to the Village Church, 
even from the beloved Metropolitan Tabernacle to the tiny Baptist Church in the South, the institution or the system or the show I'm speaking of is common to most churches that would call themselves Christian. I realize that there are some teachers that are clearly more biblical than others. What I'm addressing is a ubiquitous platform used by apostates and well-meaning but uninformed Christians throughout America and abroad. The platform is such that it is never questioned. We assume that it is correct, for we have scarcely heard of another. If Spurgeon did it, it can't be wrong. If Luther did it, if Wesley did it, if Baxter did it, if Tozer did it, if Ravenhill did it, my dear Christian, when did the standard stop being the Word of God? When did the example put forth by anyone render the Word of God irrelevant? At what point did the suggestion or command of anyone invalidate the nobility of searching the Scriptures daily to see whether these things are so? We have become a people lacking in diligence, lazy, blindly trusting, had by the con man's tactic of social compliance. Whether a person's motives are beneficent or nefarious is ultimately inconsequential. You've heard it said that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There's no excuse for laziness, especially on the part of those who are esteemed as teachers and pastors. So the question then is, what does the Bible say about church gatherings? Firstly, it is important to address what, or rather, who the church is. The question, where do you go to church, is an incoherent question. Just like, what color is 3 p.m.? Or, how much does blue weigh? They're nonsense questions. The church is not a place, but a people. Unfortunately, the biblical definition of the church has been lost in trends. An ecclesia, the Greek word we translate as church, is defined by Strong's Greek Dictionary of the New Testament as a calling out, that is, a popular meeting, a religious congregation. This word stresses a group of people called out for a special purpose. I think it's worth noting that William Tyndale, who translated the first English Bible from Greek and Hebrew, and effectively gave us the King James Version, translated the word ecclesia as congregation, never church. According to the Bible, a Christian church or congregation is just that, a group of Christians exclusively. Are all members of a basketball team basketball players? Obviously, being a player is a prerequisite to being on a team. It's no different with the church. But what about the age-old saying, the church is a hospital for sinners? It's rubbish. Counter-biblical nonsense that lazy people have adopted because it sounds good. And it's good for business. So, by definition, the church is not a place. Now, let's see what the Bible has to say. The book of Acts gives us some of the clearest definitions of the Christian church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 says this, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and about 3,000 souls were added to them. Acts chapter 2 and verse 44 says, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And verse 47 says, Then the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 describes the church 
as that which God purchased with his own blood. So the church are they whom God has purchased. The terms church, saints, and brethren are synonymous. All refer to believers. Nearly every letter in the New Testament is addressed to a church, churches, or saints collectively or individually. They presuppose a believing audience. The introduction in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Later in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27, Paul says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. The body of Christ, or the church, is comprised of those who have been regenerated, who have gladly received the word, who have been baptized, have called on the name of Jesus, in short, a group of people who are no longer sick, but have been made well. The hospital analogy is absurd. A better description might be this. The church is a group of formerly terminally ill patients who have been made well by Dr. Jesus. Or better, a group of formerly dead people who were miraculously raised to life by Jesus. The common, unifying, harmonizing factor between those in the church is an encounter with Jesus that ended in their conversion. Then they became a part of the congregation. Unbelievers are not, nor can they be, a part of the church. I focus here first because the system has blurred the lines for the sake of numbers under the guise of reaching the world. Subsequently, there are marquees inviting any and everyone with promotions of the biggest names in Christianity, which is ultimately a business strategy with no biblical precedent. Now that we've clarified who the church is, the question is, how are they to behave or operate when they meet? Where do they meet? Perhaps the clearest verse in the New Testament, which is a command as to what a church gathering should look like, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 26, which says this, How is it then, brethren, or how should it be? Whenever you come together, each of you has a song, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, Let all things be done for edification. Each of you. Well, that's not right. Pastors do this stuff. You see, our problem is that we are interpreting the scriptures by our experience rather than allowing the scriptures to dictate what our experiences are. But let's continue reading. Verse 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and God. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. Verse 30, but if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent for you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Question. When have you ever seen anything like this in a church service? Can you imagine what would happen if you interrupted the sermon and said the Lord had given you a word? You would be asked to leave and possibly physically removed.
What we see prescribed here, that is commanded, not described, is an interactive, participatory family gathering. There is no main contributor and no mention of what we call a sermon. There is teaching, and it is orderly, but it is not governed by a program, but rather by the Holy Spirit. Notice that there's no mention of a pastor, or elders at all for that matter, but Paul assumes everyone will contribute in some capacity, as there is some gift given to every Christian. These few verses alone are incredibly damning to the church system that has become the standard. I've heard some foolishly say that this command is for the church of Corinth only and does not apply to the 21st century Christian. Really, well, let's examine that for a moment, shall we? Speak the same thing. Be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Flee sexual immorality. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Does anyone believe that these verses do not apply to Christians today? Of course not. It's foolish. All of these are from the same letter to the Corinthians, and perhaps most bitingly, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37 says this, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him understand that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant, or rather, if anyone disregards this, he ought to be disregarded. Those who raise this objection, which is one of over-contextualization, are typically those benefiting from the current system. By this logic, I can throw out the entire book of 1 Corinthians, and therefore every letter of Paul, since none of them are written to me directly. Come to think of it, nothing in the New Testament is directly written to me, this is an absolutely foolish line of thinking. Ignoring context is foolish and dangerous, but so is over-contextualizing. Rightly divide the word of truth. There is no good reason this passage does not apply to the 21st century. On the contrary, these are all New Covenant commands. There is good reason to forego many Old Testament commands because they are within the realm of a Christless covenant. So we have a group of believers gathered together, all contributing somehow, numerous teachers, orderly, yet without program. And the overwhelming precedent we see in the New Testament for location is within houses. Though it is not commanded, it is worth noting the several examples of this. Why would I not desire to emulate the original church as closely as possible? The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Yet, ignorant and devious men have sought to re-erect it and many old covenant elements, such as tithing, either because it supports them monetarily or because it conforms to their tradition. I find it peculiar, almost laughable, how startlingly similar the proceedings and overall function of any Protestant church service is to the Roman Catholic Mass. They are nearly identical, minus the garb and program points. I'm not speaking of doctrinal belief, but the perpetuation of the erroneous clergy-laity divide. This system is more clearly seen in the mega-church world, in the same way a diamond seems to be more vibrant when the backdrop is black. But do not be deceived, though perhaps more biblical in many ways, small churches 
suffer from this growth-stunting and disobedience ailment as well. Imagine selling a building worth thousands, and in some cases millions of dollars, and using those funds to distribute to anyone as they had need, as seen in Acts chapter 4. Imagine meeting in homes or in a park where everyone had a role to play. Imagine no programs, but a dependence upon the Holy Spirit to guide your time together. Imagine submitting to one another in godly fear. Imagine not idolizing a celebrity pastor whom you have never met and likely never will. Imagine an intimate family gathering akin to a Thanksgiving dinner. Imagine this happening on any day of the week, every day of the week, Sundays included. Imagine simply obeying the commands of Scripture, or do you elevate the traditions of men above the Word of God? Is that what's prohibiting you? It is quite convenient to have our participation outsourced to a single individual, so that all that's required of us is to toss a few dollars into a collection plate or box but for those who desire to live a truly biblical life, they are seeking a group of Christians with whom to implement these clear and beneficial commands. The church is not an institution, but a family. A group of people cannot be a business, but that's exactly what greedy men have done. They have made merchandise of God, some businesses are more profitable than others, but they all operate the same way. For some of you, this concept, this command, will remain something imagined because you are too scared or too comfortable to challenge with godly authority this establishment, or because you don't know how this is feasible not knowing anyone who has voiced a similar concern, I feel for you. And that is precisely the reason I'm making this video. I hope to open the eyes of those who have experienced a disconnect in what they read and what they see. Those who think they are alone and don't know how to articulate their concerns. In short, this video is for my brothers and sisters in Christ whose growth has been stunted and vibrancy of life diminished due to lack of a biblically prescribed church family that is submitted to the Word of God, which is sufficient of itself to make men of God complete away with tradition and back to the Bible. This is also a rebuke to you profiteers who are fleecing God's people because you have seen how effective this system is as a business and have so deluded yourselves that you actually believe what you're doing is correct. Humble yourselves and search the scriptures to see if these things are so. Stop looking to other men as your standard and regard the word of God as it should be the supreme authority in all matters of life and especially those concerning the church. A man's words are only as good as their conformity to scripture. These are not my ideas. Read the Bible and do what it says. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Godspeed, Christian.